It's really important that we send a rover that's clean and we make sure that it doesn't contaminate Mars. My name is Mujige Stricker and I protect Mars from Earth bacteria. The next Mars rover is slated to go to Mars, collect samples, so that eventually we can bring those samples back to Earth and determine for the very first time, did life exist on Mars? There's nothing that we can build that's sterile. So we take swabs and wipes of the spacecraft as it's being built. It gets put in an oven, it gets put in various chambers and clean rooms so that we can maintain that level of cleanliness. If we do find something on Mars, we have to make sure it's something that actually came from Mars and not something that hitched a ride. This is the place where the magic happens. Oh, it's definitely cool. In this lab, we look specifically at spores. So spores are those hardy microorganisms that can actually survive if it made it on the spacecraft the journey through space, through the vacuum. It's very humbling to be a part of this big project because there are hundreds of people that have to come together and build a spacecraft. There is no one person that can say, I did this, I made this happen. It's always a we. I owe it all to Carl Sagan and watching the cosmos. I remember being a little kid, going to the public library and renting that VHS. And from that moment, the light bulb turned on. It actually was the start of my passion of science communication. We are citizens of our universe. We have to be good ambassadors when we are exploring other planets, other moons. And so it's the right thing to do. This is Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. JPL is where the Mars 2020 mission and Perseverance rover are managed. Getting to Mars is a test of perseverance in itself. There are so many incredible stories from the thousands of people who are part of the mission. Today, we're with one of the many faces behind the spacecraft. Mujike Stricker is the Planet Protectionary Lead for Mars 2020. She is making sure the Perseverance rover carries as few microbes as possible from Earth to Mars. She joins us live from the Remote Planetary Protection Lab at Kennedy Space Center. She is there by herself and will answer some questions. Now, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, you can leave them right here in the YouTube chat or post them to social media with the Ask NASA hashtag. Thanks for talking to us today, Moo. Thanks for having me. So to start off, why are you at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida? Uh, the, so the hardware comes from JPL, from all around the United States and around the world. And it's integrated and tested at JPL in part, but we still have to bring it here to the Kennedy Space Center, finish up tests, put it on a rocket and launch it to Mars. So that's why we're here. We're getting toward that late stage. We're, we're pretty close to launch. Now you're a planetary protection lead. That is a pretty cool title. So what does your job entail? <laughs> Uh, so my job entails making sure, and my team also with me, make sure that we can build, test, launch, and land the hardware in a way that keeps the spacecraft clean. Uh, the Perseverance rover will carry a limited amount of biological contamination from Earth, and we have to make sure that it's low so that we can preserve the natural environment on Mars. And kind of to that, why is it important to keep it so clean? Yeah, besides it being the right thing to do, as you go there, obviously you don't want to contaminate the environment that you're exploring and trying to understand its past, right? Um, so besides it being the right thing to do, it's also part of an international treaty that we've signed. So uh, the United States is a signatory to an international treaty called the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, and that treaty mandates that we have to limit the total amount of microorganisms that we send on our spacecraft. Now, speaking of the rover, it was recently named Perseverance, and I want to get your thoughts. What does the name mean to you personally? Yeah, Perseverance, I was so excited when that name was chosen. There were amazing candidates, but Perseverance in itself is really resonates with me. In addition to building this complicated rover that takes a lot of perseverance on the day to day, it also took a lot of perseverance in every one of our lives, in my own life, just to get to where I am today. You had to persevere through so many struggles, a lot of schooling, uh, just to get to, to be part of this. So perseverance has many, many meanings and all great meanings for me. Very true, lots of layers. And I wanna know actually, how did you get where you are today? Like, what did you study in school? 
what kind of jobs led to you to where you are now? Yeah, so I started off with an undergraduate degree, a bachelor's degree in physics, where I studied atmospheric sciences at Hampton University in Virginia. Uh, and there I started morphing into the love of plasma physics. And for my master's and PhD, I actually studied at Drexel University and made plasma devices that would sterilize different spacecraft materials. So it was a very natural progression to move into planetary protection because you need to make sure you can clean your hardware and keep it clean. So that's what my entire PhD dissertation is about. That's great. So now that I'm done with my questions, I'm going to see what people have on social media to ask you. Manish on Twitter asks, with respect to at NASA Persevere mission, what were the top technology challenges in the whole effort? Wow. So there are, I'm sure if you ask this question to any person, they'll have a completely different answer depending on their perspective. So I'll speak just to my perspective of planetary protection. When you look at the technology challenges that we have, the biggest thing is looking at the new and unique materials. That is ultimately a great thing, right? We have these materials that can make processors work more quickly um, that really optimize our ability to do great science. The thing is, a lot of that is has material compatibility issues. So back in the day when Viking was built and launched, before it was launched, it was actually put together and pushed into an oven so that it would be sterilized as an entire system. The thing is, with this entire shift in technologies, a great shift in technologies, many materials aren't compatible to high temperatures. So my big technology challenge is keeping up with the evolution of materials to make sure we can continue to keep it clean. And we have really great options actually for the 2020 mission, including vapor hydrogen peroxide. So if you go to your store, the drugstore, and you go to the first aid aisle, that hydrogen peroxide that you see on the shelf, it's kind of like that except more concentrated and vaporized. And basically that can sterilize any material that's compatible with that process. So there are a lot of great challenges that we've overcome uh, every single day. I was kind of speaking of the store. Uh, Shotoku Tech on Twitter asks, is this where all the disinfectant wipes have gone? <laughs> That's a great question. So we at JPL and within NASA, right, we're, we love calculating and planning ahead. And so this mission has been in the works for over seven years, but at least myself personally, I've been working with the mission for seven years. And early on in the mission, we have to determine how many supplies that we need, including disinfectants, right, and dis disinfecting wipes. And so that was calculated early on. And so we didn't take any extra disinfectant wipes. In fact, we just have the just enough for what we need to do so that we're not taking away from the, the efforts that and the places where they really need it. Planning ahead. Now, Daniel yeah. on Twitter asks, what did any Earth microbes just die when leaving the Earth's atmosphere? Yeah, and another, all these great questions. I love it. Um, so yes and no, right? There are classes of microbes. So if you saw in that little blurb of the video, uh, we look in particular for bacterial endospores because all of the normal bacteria on your skin, the staph, the EI, they won't survive in the vacuum of space just fully exposed. Of course, if they were protected, like in the International Space Station, possibly, right? But out in the exposed vacuum of space, they would not survive. But we do look for bacterial endospores or spores because those things are capable of staying in this dormant-like shell state. Uh, and it can even withstand being dormant for tens of millions of years. And until the conditions are favorable, it will stay dormant and then it could germinate and grow. So we specifically look for those spores to make sure that they don't make its way to Mars because it could survive the journey, the cold uh, vacuum of space. Now, Maximilian has a question for you. Did your a job exist during Apollo? Oh, that's a great question. So our job actually started somewhere around 1967, actually exactly 1967, okay. when the, wow. the Outer Space Treaty was signed. <laughs> Um, and from that moment, actually before then and during the Apollo times, right, there was things like quarantine uh, that was kind of a prevalent knowledge that everybody knew that if you're coming from outer space and you're coming back, then you probably need to isolate yourself. 
just in case something is there. But at least when we signed that international treaty in 1967, that is when planetary protection was officially a thing. And that's why Viking was the first mission that PP planetary protection was implemented on. Now, how will the Perseverance rover prepare for sample return? Does it put it in a box with samples on the ground for pickup? That's what Thomas S. on YouTube wants to know. Yeah, so the architecture as it stands today, and right now it's not an official project, so big asterisk, right? Um, but what we're gonna do for the 2020 mission is collect the samples on the surface of Mars, and every once in a while, there's gonna be a caching depot of a bunch of tubes that are gonna be deposited on the surface of Mars, waiting for a future mission to come and pick it up to eventually send back to Earth. Now, I have one from Hannah from YouTube. She says, I'm from Mexico and I'm only a teenager. What can I do to work in the future as a chemist at NASA? Wow, that's a really great question. The, the thing is with NASA as a whole, we do the NASA believes in international collaboration and it's evidenced by our 2020 rover, right? There are seven different payload instruments and several of them come from Norway, from Spain, and, and our international partners, France, the UK, um, are vital because it doesn't matter really with the borders. What matters is your scientific technology and, and just ready, readiness to learn and, and help us get to the next hurdle of understanding. And so it's great that you're a young future scientist from Mexico. I would say still keep an eye out on NASA, obviously, because international collaborations are happening all the time. Um, just be passionate about your work, study, and pave your own way. Follow, of course, the giants, but also figure out what makes you excited because that will be your thing, your expertise to really make you shine and be appealing for NASA. That is a great answer. So Tariq Ali on YouTube asks, what are the procedures for checking the sanitation of the rover? Ah, so there are many steps that we use uh, to check how clean the rover is. In fact, we've taken over 10,000 wipes and swabs of the spacecraft, of the rover itself, the launch vehicle, of the descent stage, that rocket jetpack that's gonna help it land on the surface of Mars. We have over 10,000 swabs and wipes of those particular surfaces and we grow them up in the lab and we actually make sure that not only is it clean because we would prefer to see nothing grow on the plates right but sometimes things pop up and we actually can identify what it is uh, you can actually see whether or not it's a spore or a non-spore spore forming microorganism you can find a lot of really interesting things about what is living in the clean room environment now, kind of Lily Jean Holt has a follow-up question for that from YouTube. She asks, how long do you spend on a typical job? Ooh, on a typical job uh, within NASA or within the 2020 mission? I'll, maybe I'll answer let's, from the perspective of... Let's do 2020 okay. mission. Yeah, yeah. So, it dep so depending on the, the mission life cycle, right, there are times where mm -hmm. I'm spending all day, every day in the clean room um, especially if we have a critical integration happening. Uh, I have to spend sometimes five, six hours in the clean room, making sure that the hardware comes up and integrates into the spacecraft in a way that maintains the cleanliness. Other times I'm sitting at my computer on meetings, on telecons, and making sure that we have all the right protocols in place so that we can continue to keep that spacecraft clean. So a lot of meetings, a lot of lab work, and a lot of clean room work is kind of my day to day. <laughs> and um, telecons yeah. are usually telephone conferences, right? Yeah. Thank, thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> telephone conferences. conferences. Um, and yeah, and, and then the life cycle of the mission is like seven years. I've been working on this for about seven years. So what will I do after this? Just sadly sit and think about the samples now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'll find something good to do with your time now. Pete from Definitely. YouTube asks, what have you learned from this pandemic that you can apply to Mars exploration? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, what I'm really excited about is what others have learned about the pandemic that is kind of similar to what I do on the day to day. I'm actually kind of um, interested to see how other people react to 
Uh, for example, having face coverings. Uh, face coverings are something that we do all the time in uh, clean environments. So going outside of the lab and seeing other people with face covers, like, whoa, that's, that's great that they're doing that. It's the right thing to do. It's being done sustainably, especially for the face covers that you can wash. Um, so it's what excites me is that other people are learning very indirectly about the importance of planetary protection because we're doing the same thing just from person to person. You're making sure your microbes kind of stay with you and other people's microbes stay with them. So you're just being responsible with your with the spread of your microbes. And we have one more question. James Driscoll on YouTube wants to talk about what you're wearing. I see you're in a smock. What other things do you wear around the spacecraft? We kind of touched on that, but tell us about your gear. Yeah, so our gear is pretty cool, I would say. Uh, we call it uh, the main suit that we wear. It's called a bunny suit. Um, and this bunny suit protects the spacecraft from the number one source of contamination in the clean room, which are humans. So in the clean room, we typically wear a face mask, a hairnet, the full bunny suit, um, including boots on our feet because the second biggest source of contamination is the environment. So you want to make sure you have clean shoes so that when you walk in, you don't track in a bunch of dirt. Um, so we wear that on a day to day in the clean room. When we're working with the most critical pieces of hardware, the seals, the tubes, everything that will touch the Martian soil, we actually add an extra level of, of barrier. We actually wear sterile goggles because everybody has eyelash mites and mites on their face, whether or not you know it, fun fact. Um, and so we have to keep those mites on our eyes and face separate from especially those critical parts. So we have a whole other layer of sterile goggles, sterile gloves, and a sterile smock on top. So lots of fun things that we planned from years ago uh, that is really getting us to mission success. That's great. And I want to thank you so much for talking to us. You have one of the coolest jobs, I must say. So thank you for joining us and thank you for your thank questions. You. Thanks, Moo. Bye. Thanks. Hey. Now, the launch period for Mars 2020 opens on July 17th, and the rover is slated to land on the Red Planet February 18th, 2021. For the latest on the mission, follow at NASA Persevere on Twitter and Facebook. You can watch all the behind the spacecraft video profiles on the NASA 360 YouTube channel. And we'll be doing Q and A's with the Mars 2020 team members every Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern for the next few weeks. And if you want to explore the universe from the comfort of your home, check out our NASA at home activities for families and kids of all ages. You can find them on the nasa.gov homepage. Great. Thanks for watching, everyone.